Hello, good afternoon uh, and welcome to you all, uh, all our MBA students of IGNU. Uh, today's uh, topic, uh, the topic of this session would be structural dimensions of Indian economy. This particular topic uh, relates to the course on economic and social environment, which is uh, one of the basic courses of our MBA program. Uh, because uh, studying the economic and social environment is important because as managers you do not function in vacuum. All the economic and social factors which have impact on business firms need to be studied carefully if you want to become a successful manager in your organization. This particular uh, environment may be, may includes your job, your department, your organization, your nation and the world around you. At the national level, that is at the macro level, it is important for you to study what are the structural dimensions of uh, our economy, that is Indian economy, and how these changes uh, influence business firms in which they operate. Right now we are going to cover the uh, significance of economic growth and development and uh, the ex growth experience curve, what are the structural changes in India's savings and investment. All these things we are going to discuss in the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes and we have uh, Professor Arindam Banik as our resource pers person today to discuss this topic. Now I request uh, Professor Banik uh, to take the session. Please, Professor. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, the, this is a unit for entitled Structural Dimensions of Indian Economy. Uh, today, uh, if you see the coverage, uh, we'll be talking about introduction economic growth and development, and then economic growth, economic development, structure of national output, structure employment, structure of investment and capital formation, and structure of consumption. Uh, now, uh, what is actually socio-economic environment of a country? Uh, you can analyze uh, socio-economic environment of a country with the help of analyze institutional framework and physical framework. And when you talk about the institutional framework, the economic policy statement of the government, economic plan documents, the political constitutions, economic regulations, controls, among others which define the role and status of private sector, multinationals, corporations, small business, etc. Uh, and when you talk about the physical framework, trends in economic variables such as income, price, output, investment, foreign trade, labor supply, and other factor endowments. Now, uh, a knowledge economic trends and, and structural changes helps the firm to plan uh, out a corporate strategy and policy to cope with short run and long run challenges of business environment that simply explain without knowledge of, of the institutional framework and without knowledge of the physical framework it is difficult to understand or to operate in a particular country and because of that reason uh, uh, the understanding of both institutional and physical uh, uh, framework are considered as powerful ingredient of the corporate strategy in this context. Now, first we define actually what is economic growth and, and development. Uh, 
When you talk about the economic growth, we consider more output. When you talk about the more output, that simply explains more GDP of the country, which is known as uh, gross domestic product of a country. Now, economic development is not only more output, and changes in technical and institutional arrangement by which it is produced and distributed. And note, we are highlighting here is basically distribution aspects, not only the more output to be considered in this context. Uh, if you see the India's current growth story and the development exercise, uh, growth of India, if you see post-1991 situation, we, we basically uh, argue that uh, 1947 to 1990, the growth is basically within the range of, uh, say, uh, not more than 3 to 4 percent growth rate. And suddenly we found post-1991 situation, the growth is defined by 9 percent. But if the growth is very high, uh, that simply explains, uh, you, you can interpret that uh, uh, the economy is also doing brilliantly in terms of development aspects. Uh, Perhaps this is not the story, what we are, are basically trying uh, to argue. For example, organized sector employment remains constant uh, in Indian context, despite you have the growth rate of 9%. More interestingly in India, organized sector employment contributes about 15 to 20% of the total employment, and of this, 70% of the public sector and 30% of the private sector. Interestingly, growth is very high, but this particular growth fails to generate employment due to their other rigidities such as education and required skill. That simply explains uh, you have the growth, but that growth perhaps failed to percolate it down to across the population, ac across the rural areas. And that simply explains why they fail, because of the failure of our skill-based education, failure to provide elementary and basic education infrastructure to the, uh, to the population. And because of that reason, you may have the high growth rate, and then it, it failed to spread across region. Mm -hmm. That's the reason, you know, in recent time, development economists argue the two India stories. Uh, one, story, one India is defined by highly prosperous development and highly developed, and, and the other regions basically backward, equa equally backward, and not at all prosperous. That simply explains you need enough investment in those areas question comes, then what is development? The development issues are unresolved. For example, we have, we have all intuitive notions of development. When we speak of a developed society, we picture in our minds a society in which people are well fed, well clothed, possess access to variety of commodities, have the luxury of some leisure and entertainment, and live in a healthy environment. We think of a society free from violent discrimination with tolerable levels of equality where sick receive proper medical care and people do not have sleep on the sidewalks. In short, most of us would insist that a minimal requirement for a developed nation is that the physical quality of life be high and be so uniformly rather than being restricted to an incongruously affluent minority. Of course, the notion of a good society goes further. We might stress political rights and freedom, intellectual and cultural development, stability of the family, a low crime rate, and so on. However, a high and equally accessible level of material well-being is probably a prerequisite for most other kinds of advancement, quite apart from being a worthy goal in itself. That simply explain the kind of development we, we see, uh, or if you see that we are basically talking about not only growth uh, in terms of GDP, but we are talking about the welfare of the society. That simply explains medical care, 
ports are basically uh, 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 feeling that they are safe in the society and able to take advantage of the government various poverty reductions or poverty alleviation programs and that simply explains state is responsible for the welfare of the society. Uh, in addition to that we mentioned uh, the development is the crime rates, freedom, intellectual stimulation, cultural development, they are all important when you talk about uh, development. There are always a debate among the economists that the growth and development perhaps uh, not, uh, 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 not simultaneously fail to go together. Uh, but people argue uh, uh, it, it is quite possible if you see the, uh, the Nordic states, for example, Finland, uh, then, then Denmark, then, uh, then Norway, uh, Sweden. These are the brilliant example how growth and, and uh, the, the human development are basically working together. Now, since you are, are basically emphasizing um, understanding growth, then as, as an economist or as a business economist, how you basically quantify it? And uh, in other words, uh, how to uh, see the growth in terms of empirical justification? For example, if growth is defined by G, which is equals to Y2 defined by the year, and Y1 is the previous year, uh, and Y2 is the current year, that simply explains you divide by Y1 base, and multiplied by 100, that is the growth in percentage. When you see the growth, growth is basically, we are, we are mentioning here, uh, GDP of the country. Uh, now, when you talk about the GDP of the country, as you know, in, in the macroeconomics, uh, the GDP is, is not of the nominal GDP. Non nominal GDP, we know, goods and services produced in the current year, multiply by the uh, uh, current year price that simply explains the prices are not adjusted. Now, when you basically mention a country's growth rate is behaving like say 6 to 8 percent to 9 percent, that simply explains we are basically trying to understand the growth in terms of uh, real growth of the economy, not the nominal growth of the economy. That means that current growth should be adjusted in respect of, uh, uh, of the uh, price adjustment, which is uh, known as GDP deflator. Now, as you know, goods and services produced multiplied by the current year is basically giving you a kind of um, real GDP of the country. And then, to get the real price or real GDP, you divide the figure by GDP deflator for that particular year. Normally, government statistical agencies, they, provide, they will provide you the GDP deflator in respect to particular year. Now, real GDP per capita, uh, which is basically uh, real GDP per capita divided by number of population of the country. Issue is that in terms of real GDP, real GDP, absolute number, India is the fifth largest economy in terms of absolute real GDP. But per capita wise, the performance is not satisfactory. For example, India, as I already mentioned, India is the fifth largest economy in the world. But in terms of uh, per capita, uh, is only uh, their per capita income in terms of dollar terms, maybe six to seven hundred dollars, uh, uh, which is maybe top 80 or 90th country in the world. As I said, in terms of absolute GDP, real GDP, India is basically fifth largest economy in the world. And that simply explain the per capita wise we fail to perform. Why you fail to perform? One is the population is the problem. Then you are basically resources are not properly utilized. Now, uh, in your macroeconomics, you must have studied uh, the concept of GDP gap analysis. Uh, you have the potential GDP, assuming all the resources are basically used by the country, minus uh, the uh, resources are actually utilized. For example, if you, if you use all the resources of the country, uh, then suppose your GDP should grow perhaps by 30%, but actually is growing by 9%. That simply explains 
21% of the resources are not utilized. Why not utilized? As I already I mentioned, that possibly uh, uh, explained by government failure to intervene in effective market. Why poor remains poor? Why skills are not provided? Why educations are still in in in, in recent time? We are our education. Uh, literacy rate is only 70 to 75 percent and that too education literacy rate in India is defined by only reading and writing newspaper not the developed country uh, where uh, literacy rate is actually defined by higher secondary education. Now with the help of uh, the, the per capita income or, or I, I already mentioned that the per capita income is low because government failed to, uh, uh, to implement uh, or intervene in the welfare schemes. Uh, and you can compare this GDP data with the help of uh, intertemporal analysis, cross-section analysis of different periods, or international comparison. Our economic growth can be made with the help of time series analysis. In nowadays, it's very popular that uh, India-China comparison in terms of growth. China is growing by 12 percent. India is growing by 8 to 9 percent. China's per capita income is quite high. India's per capita is less. You know, all kinds of comparison we do. Simply, uh, why do the comparison? Because these two countries are two economies. Actually, uh, 1948, China took a different strategy to develop or to grow. India took a different strategy to develop or grow. When you are interested in comparison of levels of living, the per capita income measure is to be supplemented by per capita consumption of essential goods and services. Per capita production, availability of certain services, for example, electricity per capita. So, as economy is growing, you want to know what are the pattern of uh, per capita consumption. Is it from primary to secondary type? Or is it from secondary to the service type? or what are the production patterns, uh, are they following a standard criteria or there are any other <coughs> problems and how resources are actually distributed, for example energy, electricity, uh, uh, you will find that all developed countries consumption of electricity is quite high uh, compared to the developing countries. So that I I this kind of data is giving you a certain kind of understanding that what are the, the, the problems or impediments uh, so far India is concerned in understanding uh, the consumption of electricity or energy in this context. Now I have uh, see the graphs, uh, if you see the graphs, uh, agriculture output uh, of India, industry and services, how, how they are actually growing. Um, you can find out that uh, uh, the major contributory factor of India's growth in recent time, if it is a, a, at all by 9 percent that simply explain is the service sector. Now, those who are the, having the background of the macroeconomics, you know, when economy is growing, it's going from agriculture, then manufacturing, then services. And interestingly, in the Indian case, uh, it's different. It's, it's not according to that condition. It's going, uh, it's basically bypass uh, or uh, the bypassing the manufacturing suddenly <coughs> going by service sector. And in the service sector, employment should not be generated in accordance with the condition of the manufacturing. In other words, uh, uh, we have to create efficient skilled manpower, which is the basic condition of the development in manufacturing, and that is very important job to do. Uh, we should not be satisfied that our, since our services are growing, we are better off. That is not the case because major population are basically are or, or fail to enjoy uh, the the benefits of the uh, the growth. You can see uh, uh, again. I am using the inter-country comparison: India, China. How China is growing and how India is growing. If you plot the graphs, if you have the GDP, real GDP data, perhaps you can do the same way. How things are working so far. India and China are concerned. Now, uh, if you see that India's real GDP growth uh, in terms of in recent time. Uh, uh, my period I have considered 91, 92 to 2003 to 4. You must have seen the growth is always above the 8%. Uh, there are certain problems, but uh, more or less one 
cannot, uh, you know, in recent time, uh, that one can always uh, uh, see that growth of the economy should always be more than 7 to 8 percent if you use the growth patterns, which is basically strong deviation from 1947 to 1990. And as I mentioned, in those days we are basically following the closed economy model, and now we are basically following the the open economy, I mean, it has given the results, so my growth is concerned, but as I said, that growth is, is basically to be, uh, uh, to be spreaded now across population, which is a, a major task to, to, should be pursued by, by the government. There is another indicator, uh, we often use labor productivity. Uh, which is basically output per worker. Now, I I if it is the national level output, we are not considering worker defined by those are actually employed. Uh, important point, not the populations. So, output defined by GDP of the country, which GDP of the country? It's basically real GDP of the country. And divided by labor force participation rate, that simply is how laborers are actually employed. The GDP of the country is basically defined by, uh, uh, defined by or labor productivity is defined by per, uh, GDP per labor per force participation rate. And now, implications, optimum utilization of labor in developing economy, which is labor abundant. So you can make out with this particular indicator, uh, what are the levels of, if it is basically a labor intensive country, what are the optimum utilization of labor in a developing country which is labor abundant? We have already mentioned, explained the broad definition of economic development. Uh, uh, structure of national output, sectoral contributions. Uh, sectors are defined by agriculture, non-agriculture such as manufacturing services. As I mentioned, since service sector is dominating, of the total GDP of the country, if the agriculture contribution is at 22 percent, and you can find out, uh, theoretically, uh, the manufacturing should, should dominate, and then the service. Interesting, in, in the Indian case, service sector dominates, not the manufacturing. So it is not following the standard economic conditions because uh, th there are certain problems and uh, problems of the society and government is basically exclusively failure here uh, to provide uh, if a defective skill to the population so that they can find out job in the manufacturing. So w with the help of this data, you can see the sectoral contributions of, of, uh, of manpower and how they are actually distributed across uh, 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 the period in term temporal analysis, you compare with other countries, international comparison, you can make out what is going on in, in the country. Uh, so as I said, sectoral means the shifts, uh, year to year analysis, uh, from agriculture to manufacturing, manufacturing to services, as I already mentioned post-1991 situation is basically giving us a, a kind of result where we can find out that uh, agriculture to services, not the manufacturing, and one must analyze it. And interestingly, I already mentioned jobs are not created due to services. But who are the people actually 9% growth rate and who are the people are benefited out of that situation that simply expect highly skilled population and Thanks to government effective intervention in the uh, uh, in the skill intensive based education institutions in this context, engineering education, IITs, they are the major contributory factors. Now, in the Indian context, uh, which is very interesting, uh, agriculture contributes 20 to 25 percent of our GDP, but in terms of employment, it contributes. 50% of the total employment. Why? Uh, interesting. Uh, if you see, as I want to mention, 20 to 25% only contribution from GDP, but manpower involved to produce that 20 to 25% of GDP is about 50% of the labor. That simply explains most of the labor are, are not properly or effectively utilized. So manpower is huge in agriculture, but it failed to give effective result in this context that simply explain certain group of 
uh, agricultural laborers should be taken out from the agriculture. And that simply again explains government effective education system, skilled based education systems, and efficient uh, local level institutions. And because of that reason, perhaps it can change the situation. Otherwise, it is difficult in the long run, so far India is concerned. Structure of investment and capital formations. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are always mentioned government failure uh, to to implement uh, uh, the effective education because, as as we have already seen it, that 50 percent of the uh, labor in agriculture, or then they are contributing only 20 percent of the total output of the country, and that simply explains: Do we have the enough money or resources to implement the programs? Uh, in developing economies, at the initial stage of development, the resources are deliberately shifted from consumption goods to capital goods. Thus, the investment structure changes. Now, at the initial st stage of development, what you do basically uh, is not consumption driven. No, you basically fill, you need machines to grow, you need uh, uh, mechanization to grow, you need technology to grow. So emphasize is like from the government's point of view or different sectors point of view, you spend money or resources in the capital goods sectors. So if you decide to spend money on capital goods, not the consumption terms, that simply expand the country perhaps decided to grow using the capital goods route. Question comes, how to create capital? Uh, we mentioned the capital investments and determinant of capital output ratio. Uh, incremental capital output ratio, or ICOR, is a popular concept, is the additional capital required to increase output by one more unit. Now, if you, for example, empirically, G has to be determined, that simply explains rate of investment divided by incremental capital output ratio. For example, in order to achieve 5% growth rate, I mean if a country decides to go by 5%, how much rate of investment required? Considering I core is equal to 4. Now 5% growth rate is equals to, because it is basically determined that you should, the, the country should grow by 5 percent, that simply explains rate of investment divided by i core. and i core is given here 4, so rate of investment divided by, by 4, and if you rearrange this equation, you can find out uh, what should be the rate of investment in the country if the country decide to grow by 5 percent. And that simply explains rate of investment, as I mentioned, five percent, and, and four is the I core. That means you need. Sorry, there's a mistake here. It should be twenty, not twenty-two. So it's the country should should grow by twenty percent. Uh, the investment rate should be twenty percent. Uh, this is a very important point. As I said, if country has to grow by five percent, that simply explains that you should know the I core rate, and and then. Uh, you should know the, f uh, the growth of the country. So investment should be there at the rate of 22 percent. That only helps the, uh, uh, the country to grow by, by uh, uh, 5 percent. Changes in capital output ratio is a dimension of economic growth and development process. So this has to be grow from, from, from the economy. Otherwise, uh, you cannot grow by 5 percent. And so that is very important. Uh, so far, incremental capital output ratios are concerned. The upward trend in per capita income, which initiate accelerate changes in production, employment, factor production, skill, and capital formation, directly brings about a change in structure of consumption. As I already mentioned, uh, you decided to grow at, at the initial stage of development. Uh, uh, not consumption, but capital goods sector. You know why you are basically decided to uh, capital goods sector. That simply explains that uh, it, it, they are growing, then other sector will uh, automatically be growing, and then that perhaps explain that 
uh, house uh, basically taking place, the groups are taking place. And uh, see, if you now see the same analysis after five or six years, if it's at all, capital goods sector is basically working very well, you can shift the total change in the capital goods sector, and people will be moving to consumption different because you have got the job, then you are basically moving your consumption of different types. You must have seen the recent McKinsey report. Uh, the, the consumption behavior of uh, a, a certain group of people in, in urban centers. Uh, and if you find out consumption behavior of those group of people in the urban center, those are basically skilled, professional, and their consumption behavior uh, and how services are dominating, the credit cards are dominating, their lifestyles are dominating, uh, 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 their eating habits are dominating. And if you compare that uh, a kind of analysis with the help of uh, a village farmer, you can find out the differences. That simply explains as economy is growing uh, with the help of capital goods sectors, that it's moving, if it is at all moving at a certain stage, you can find out the behaviors will be changing. Now, important point is that, uh, as I mentioned, that 5% to grow, you need 20% of the investment to grow. Do we have enough amount of money or resources or savings to generate 20% investment rate and that simply explains what is the savings rate of India and what is the investment rate of India. You know already, uh, perhaps you have studied it in, 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 in various newspapers, uh, uh, China for example, their savings rate is about more than 48%, our savings rate is, is, is equal to 30%, but at the, at the lower level of income, that is a very important point. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, why it is lower level, of, your per capita is only 700, uh, 600 or 700 US dollar, and at that level, the, which is the lower level, your savings rate is only 30 percent. That s simply explains enough savings are not created in the economy to grow the economy further, uh, say, say a double digit or, or 10 percent, 12 percent, something like that, and that savings, how to create? And it is only possible that savings can be created by foreign savings. And foreign savings defined by, you, you have already know, uh, you must be knowing from the balance of payments, your foreign sector should be, current account should be surplus, which is known as foreign savings, and foreign savings added to your local savings, that means your global savings, and that uh, basically explaining your uh, investment rate. Because savings minus investment is a tax component. So uh, you, you you say that the, you pay tax with government expenditure, then in, then rate of investment coming into picture. And since your savings rate may be 30 percent, but at the lower level, that simply explains enough savings are not generated in the economy uh, to employ vast population in the country. And because of that reason, uh, we need foreign savings or foreign investment to grow. And here is very important point we are mentioning that the savings investment gap and Indian prosperity or Indian growth in the, in the future uh, 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 projection, if you want, want to project in for the future, uh, these investments are basically very, very important and one must then analyze that what should the savings be here in, in, the, in the next future for us and how much investment are created and how much foreign savings are created and how and if foreign savings are at all created the government should spend money for its education skill level which is very important so far india's growth studies are concerned as i already mentioned growth is not the sufficient and essential condition for the development so uh, growth is part of the story of the country's prosperity. Other part of the story is basically defined by development, which is basically not only growth, other aspects of the society. With this, thank you very much. Hello. Uh, with this, we come to the close of this session. Uh, thank you, Professor Banik, uh, for covering a wide range of issues like uh, uh, economic growth and uh, development. Uh, what are the changes in uh, savings and uh, investment uh, by the government, uh, how uh, government intervention is uh, needed for the welfare of the society because the business has to function in a society and these two have uh, 
uh, interaction uh, with the therefore it is very important for you as managers to understand that these changes which have implications for your business uh, with this i think uh, we end this session unless you have some queries regarding these issues uh, i think there are no questions i th uh, we'll meet at uh, again at 2:30 this afternoon till then we stand by the studios